so it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to be part of this conference. It's very exciting development. Um, so there is a relationship between quantum systems and gravity. And there is a wild hypothesis is that any quantum system is equivalent to a theory of gravity, some quantum gravity theory. Um, the problem with this wild hypothesis is that we don't understand quantum gravity generally enough to be able to test this. Then there is a very concrete one, which is that very certain specific quantum systems have concrete Einstein-like uh, gravity descriptions. So you can start with the very concrete quantum systems, and it will behave um, as if it was a theory of Einstein gravity in higher dimensions. Now the caveat is this fine print here that maybe you can't read very well, um, is that these are systems with lots of symmetries, very large number of qubits, very strong interactions, very difficult probably to make in the lab. But there's something intermediate, which is that there are systems that are simple enough to be realizable and interacting enough to capture some important properties of a theory of gravity. And we'll be discussing some of these systems. Um, now, let me do a little cartoon first, just to orient ourselves. So in this discussion, there are basically two parameters that we should pay attention to. One is the number of qubits we are talking about. Um, and the other is the coupling between the qubits, how strongly interacting these qubits are with each other. Now, theory, theory land, so where theories like to live, is either very large n, um, very strong coupling, that's where we expect to find Einstein gravity, or of course, very weak coupling on any n. So that's easy to analyze. Experiments will uh, usually take place with a relatively small number of n, and you can make the coupling large and so on. But, um, and our goal, I guess, through this conference is to meet somewhere in the middle and be able to, to discuss some, some common things. Um, so we'll be discussing a system which is large NSYK, where the coupling is not as large as we would like to be for, to get Einstein gravity, but we still get some very interesting aspects of gravity, and we'll discuss what those aspects are. Now, one uh, central dogma or hypothesis is uh, that a black hole, as seen from the outside, can be described as a quantum system with a number of qubits, which is equal to its entropy, given by the area of the black hole. And it also evolves according to unitary evolution. Now, a slightly better version is uh, that uh, we really describe the quantum system describes the black hole and some part of the space-time around it. So, and in order to understand the relationship between the two, it's, in, it's important to understand the space-time around the black hole. Um, and so, building that space-time around is important for isolating the black hole from the rest of the universe, our universe. And that's more or less equivalent to uh, isolating this quantum system from the rest of the universe. Um, so the idea is that an isolated quantum system at finite temperature is roughly like a black hole in a gravitational box. So some kind of universe uh, which has some confining uh, gravitational potential, so very the potential that rises very much towards the boundaries of this universe. And inside, we have a black hole. Uh, so that's the idea. Now. What is the simplex box in which we can put a black hole? So the simplex box is one that would have most symmetries. Um, and one useful symmetry that's been useful for constructing simple boxes is to have a kind of scaling symmetry in your, in your, in your system. And this scaling symmetry has something to do with the motion in the radial direction towards the black hole. Now, in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, we cannot have a continuous scaling symmetry. Um, because uh, scaling symmetry would rescale the energy levels of the, your system. And if uh, you have a discrete set of levels, you cannot have an actual uh, scaling symmetry. But we can have an approximate one. And the systems we're going to discuss have an approximate scaling symmetry that is useful for analyzing these systems. So you should think of this as approximate uh, critical systems. So critical systems, well, people discuss uh, critical uh, phenomena in uh, condensed matter physics and so on, is when um, there is an emergence of uh, very long length scales, very long time scales, and there is a scale invariance in that time scale. So here, we'll have a scale invariance in the time direction. So the system will look uh, similar at short times and at longer times. Uh, so we'll discuss two examples of uh, such systems. Um, so the first example is uh, a model uh, called the SYK model, um, introduced by Sash de Vanier and also something very non-trivial was done also by Kitaev and <coughs> George Samparkolet. Anyway, so it's a simple model uh, that involves uh, simple qubits, or more precisely, square roots of qubits, which are called Majorana fermions. Um, and 
that uh, we have only n of them, we have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, and then on that Hilbert space we have a simple uh, Hamiltonian, which contains some couplings, and the couplings are not particularly special, they can be random, so you can take them, pick them up randomly uh, with some uh, random distribution, and with some uh, variance that uh, specified by some energy scale, uh, j, and in this model, if you take uh, n very large, then you can go to very low energies, so energies much smaller than the energy scale uh, set by these couplings, and in that regime, uh, you find this approximate uh, scaling symmetry. Um, the scaling symmetry is appro approximate in the sense that if you go to very, very long times, uh, exponentially long in the number of qubits, then you are going to see the discrete spectrum that you expect in a finite system. But as long as your, your time scales are not so long, then you get uh, some behavior uh, which is consistent with this scaling symmetry. You get this approximate scaling symmetry. Um, so we need uh, relatively long times uh, so that we are a strong coupling, but the simplest regime to analyze, that the first one I'll discuss, is when uh, those time scales are not so long uh, compared to n, um, and in that regime we can compare to something that is closer to a classical theory of gravity. Okay? And then, then we'll discuss how to go beyond that to go to quantum, including quantum corrections. So that was one system. And then there is a second system that arises not in uh, obvious uh, qubit system or uh, system of Majorana fermions. It arises when you consider black holes in uh, general relativity. So you can have a four-dimensional black hole and um, there are black holes that can carry charge and those black holes uh, have to have a mass that is bigger than the charge, or will have a mass that is bigger than the charge, and when the mass is, becomes close to the charge, the black hole temperature becomes very low, and the, the, this black hole system uh, becomes critical. It, it develops a kind of scaling symmetry also, and in the gravity picture, uh, that scaling symmetry manifests itself in, into the emergence of a long throat, a long uh, region that joins the uh, near horizon region with the flat space region. And that region has uh, a special geometry which um, contains a two-dimensional sphere which is almost constant in size. And then the radial direction and the time direction form a two-dimensional curved space with uh, many symmetries. It's the analog of hyperbolic space or let's say a sphere but with negative curvature and uh, Lorentzian time. It's called uh, two-dimensional anti-sitter space. Don't worry about the name if you never heard before. It's just the simplest space with negative curvature, space-time with negative curvature. And that's the geometry that emerges in this uh, critical regime. Um, so here we have two systems, uh, both of which uh, develop uh, this critical phenomenon. And we think, because of the central hypothesis that we mentioned, that this system is described by a finite number of degrees of freedom, so it's again uh, system of uh, some qubits, we don't know exactly what the qubits are in this case, but uh, some system of qubits uh, that should, um, that is developing this uh, scaling symmetry. Um, okay, so now I'm going to describe in a little more detail the uh, geometry of these black holes, especially the geometry in the time and uh, spatial direction and, and the radial direction. So we're not going to talk about the two sphere and we can forget about the two-dimensional sphere for most purposes here and focus on the uh, motion along the radial direction. Which, um, so uh, this is a picture that uh, depicts a little map of uh, this, this space-time. Uh, so the vertical direction uh, you could think of as a time direction and the horizontal direction as a space direction. Um, it is a bit like a gravitational box in the sense that there is a gravitational potential that grows as we go to the boundaries of this box. Um, and so if you put a massive particle here in the center, the massive particle will oscillate around uh, the, the center. Now, uh, so that's just this, uh, negative, this simplest uh, negative curve space. Here, when we consider it in the black hole context, it is joined to flat space in some way. And so we don't get all of the space, we cut out a little region, so there is this red line, is basically um, corresponds to cutting off the space at this position, so we're considering the bottom part of the space time here, and we are saying, well, we, we are not going to include the flat space region and so on, we just cut this off here, and um, so uh, the exterior of the black hole 
uh, would correspond to um, the region that is between the red line and uh, these horizons. So the, the red line in this space is following an accelerated trajectory. And it's following an accelerated trajectory because if you sit at some finite distance uh, from the horizon, you feel a strong gravitational force, right? So you're you are pushed towards falling to the horizon, but you are not. You are at a fixed distance. And so it's an accelerated trajectory here. Um, and so it's accelerating. And in some sense, it looks, from the point of view of this diagram, it looks like it's leaving the system. But um, what that implies in particular is that if there is a signal that originates from this region, it cannot, be, uh, it cannot reach the red line. That, what that means is that a signal from that region of the space time uh, cannot escape uh, to the outside. So we have that region, we say it's in the interior of the black hole. So the black hole geometry is something where it has that, that part of the space time. Um, so the exterior is whatever is outside there. So, if, um, so this would represent the particle that starts here and falls into the black hole horizon. And the observations we can make from the outside involve, uh, for example, sending in, calculating, sending in a particle, or uh, perhaps sending in a particle and ask for the probability that it hasn't fallen in yet, right? So that would be related to, roughly speaking, this two-point function, the two-point expectation value of the field operator at uh, two different times uh, at, at near the boundary of the, the region. Um, now, the fact that we have some symmetries implies that this type of correlation functions, this type of expectation values, uh, have a form that is determined by the symmetries. So um, the two models, the SYK and the black hole, have the same symmetries. And therefore, this uh, two-point function uh, is, has a specific functional form that is determined by the symmetry. So don't worry about the specific, why it is sinh or not sine and so on. Don't worry about that. Just trust me that it follows from the symmetries. Okay? Um, OK. And also, uh, if you look at the entropy or the thermodynamics of the system, it has a, the entropy has a constant piece. Uh, and that's uh, also what follows from the symmetries. It's saying that the entropy is basically independent of the temperature. The first term is independent of the temperature. So that's the statement that the system is scale invariant. Uh, so no matter what temperature we pick, we have always the same entropy. Now, as we said, this cannot be exactly true. And indeed, there is a small correction uh, that is proportional to the temperature. And, um, and yeah, so that correction is related to the breaking of the symmetry. And in fact, um, the, the, the thing that breaks the symmetry is a particular mode, a particular collective uh, degree of freedom of this uh, system that is similar uh, in spirit to let's say, the face of a superconductor, so something that emerges from the collective behavior of all the fields. Um, in this case, we can say that it is a time superfluid. So it's a particular mode. Um, what is uh, changing is uh, somehow some kind of relative time delay between the uh, objects that are in the interior and the time outside, outside these black holes, or the time that uh, you have. So in the SYK context, there is uh, the time that you have in the lab and then there is a time that is self-referentially uh, um, defined within the SYK system of how things are changing. In this. And there is a relationship between the two. And um, it's governed by one particular, let's say, field or degree of freedom, uh, one particular, let's say, quantum mechanical collective quantum mechanical degree of freedom. And this degree of freedom governs, uh, in these systems, everything that has to do with the breaking of the conformal symmetry, of the scaling symmetry. And as such, uh, and there are many physical phenomena governed by this, and I'll, we'll see some examples. In the gravity description that we've uh, seen before, so here, um, that collective degree of freedom has to do with the position of this boundary, so where that boundary is sitting. So it's moving in or out, and so it's just that quantum mechanical degree of freedom of the position of that boundary. So that's the picture in the gravity. In, gravity. in uh, SYK, you can also uh, derive it from uh, a large end analysis that is somewhat similar to the analysis you do in, in BCS theory of superconductivity, if you're familiar with that, uh, to derive the phase of superconductor. If you're not familiar with that, uh, it's just how you derive in general collective degrees of freedom in, uh, in various systems, in large end systems. Um, so this mode is present on, in both cases, and anything that has to do with the dynamics of this mode will agree between the black hole uh, case and the SYK mode. 
Um, so let's say this is a very simple example of uh, how uh, this mode gives rise to some gravitational effects. Um, I should say that in, in, this, uh, in these systems, the whole gravitational dynamics or quantum gravity has to do with the dynamics of this mode. So out of all the degrees of freedom of gravity that we had originally in four dimensions, uh, once we go to this description, the only thing that remains is the quantum mechanics of this mode. Um, so for example, if we, uh, send, we have a black hole and we send in an excitation, then uh, we expect that the uh, black hole horizon will grow. So that the regions that previously were visible, and because we sent an excitation, now there will be pieces of the space-time that will not be visible. So for example, if we don't do anything, the boundary trajectory will follow this, tra this, this trajectory, and um, a signal from here could reach it. But if we send an excitation, then it will follow, uh, it will, the, the, the dynamics of this mode will, will be modified, and um, there will be a region of the space-time behind this dotted line that will not be accessible. Here I've, I've only uh, showed you the picture, but there are some formulas, very simple formulas uh, behind these pictures that, that explain how this works. Um, now I've been drawing this diagram, but I've been mostly talking about the right wedge here, that was the exterior of the black hole. And you might uh, ask, uh, what, what is uh, this other part of the diagram? So the idea is that this whole diagram is really not representing only one system, but it's representing two systems. Two, and two equal, uh, identical entangled uh, systems that are entangled in a particular very special state, which is called the thermophile double state. So it's one of my favorite states. Um, <laughs> um, I, I've been accused of being a worshiper of this state. Uh, uh, but uh, so it's an interesting state because um, it, uh, with this particular pattern of entanglement, it looks like in the gravitational description, we get a connected uh, space-time joining the two sides. So we have this connection between entanglement and geometric connection, which we think might be completely general. So this connected space-time, um, the fact that the black holes, uh, the, the extension, the black hole solution really describes uh, two black holes, uh, was something that Einstein and Rosen noticed. And uh, so we usually invented this little slogan for displaying the connection between the two, that Einstein-Rosen is the same, einstein podolsky rosen which is entanglement. Anyway, so there are some questions that arise in this, which is, um, how do you make this state? Can you make this state? Can you check that even if you make it, that it's geometrically connected? What, what would it mean to check that it is geometrically connected? Um, and we'd also like to explore some of the symmetries of this state. Uh, that's a serious order thing to do. And maybe there are many, probably many other things uh, you could do with this. It's, it's kind of an interesting, non-trivial entangled state that's probably uh, interesting. Now, one, um, there's actually a relatively simple way to, do, uh, to, to make this state in these systems that have this approximate scaling symmetry, which is the following. So you take, uh, two identical copies, for example, of the SYK model, and then you introduce a small interaction, and the interaction should involve operators um, that are correlated in the thermophile double, so that uh, have high correlations. Um, and if you add this uh, interaction, then the turns out, so for example, an example of that operator is simply taking the fermion operators on the left and the right uh, sides, uh, you get that the ground state is that uh, thermophile double. So that's uh, how you make it in the, uh, in the case of the SYK model. Uh, also in gravity, if you take two near extremal black holes, um, you bring them close together, and you let them exchange fields, then there will be, you can show that using the equations of gravity, that there is a solution that joins, uh, where the black hole throats uh, join each other and form a wormhole. Um, and what this produces is, uh, so in gravity it would produce a, geometry, which uh, in four-dimensional gravity will be produced a geometry where there is uh, this throat region that had this, AD, this um, hyperbolic space shape. It connects between the two sides, and the black hole horizon now disappears, and you have this connected geometry. Um, and the two-dimensional part of the geometry, which uh, is what you get by cutting this uh, little neck throat here uh, into uh, at the red lines, uh, now, he, here time is not represented. Here we are representing time as the vertical direction. 
So then uh, the direction along this uh, throat is the direction, the horizontal direction here. And the important point now is that this um, vertical uh, directions are stabilized. They're not running against uh, the, the, the distance between the two is not increasing. And you can send the signal from one to the other. And this signal uh, goes uh, through this wormhole. So in the gra four dimensional gravity description, you can you go into something that might look from the outside that is close to the geometry of a black hole, perhaps. You go in and you come out, out the, other, the other side. So that's in gravity. In the SYK models, you, you, you put in an excitation in one of the SYK models, and it comes out in the other one. Of course, there is not surprising. There is some interaction between the two. But what is happening is that, so one picture for what is happening is that you are putting in the excitation in one of them. It's getting broken up into pieces. And then the pieces uh, go through the interaction um, to the other side, and then it gets reconstituted on the other side. Um, now, let's start with something simple, not uh, any fancy uh, thing. So this one point I want to emphasize is that even if you forget about all this wormhole discussion and so on, uh, this particular state of uh, two coupled SYK models, or the, and something that would arise in any of these critical systems, um, is that it's a very special state. Normally, if you have a critical system and you add a perturbation that uh, generates a gap, uh, that gap state is not directly related to the original one. In particular, it will not display the scaling symmetries of the original one. But here it's a very special because um, this gap state continues to have the original symmetries of the original uh, critical system, but realized in a slightly different way. And having the same symmetries implies, in particular, for example, that the spectrum of states around this, this the spectrum of states organized into uh, representations of the relevant symmetry group. So, um, for example, we have the ground state, and then uh, we can have the first excited state that has some energy. And then there is a bunch of other states that uh, have energies that differ by certain units from the original one. Um, and so, and, and those uh, represent the motion of uh, this particle moving uh, in this space. So the fact that these come in, in integer spacings, roughly speaking, is that the uh, motion of this particle is roughly like a harmonic oscillator motion. Okay? Um, it's oscillating. Um, so all, the whole spectrum uh, of the theory is just governed by the symmetries. And in particular, there, there's also the superfluid mode that has to do with the uh, motion of the red lines. Um, and they also give rise to states with predictable energies, so with energies you can predict theoretically. Um, um, now, um, these symmetries that we're talking about are present for the thermophile double state. They are the same symmetries that were present for correlators of thermal uh, one-sided models. And they are the symmetries of the wormhole spacetime. And roughly, these symmetries, I, I mentioned the SL2 group, is basically roughly like two translations, the time translation, the space translation, and the boost symmetry of, let's say, flat Minkowski space. Locally, at each point, they act like this. Uh, because the space is curved, the actual group is slightly different. So if you never heard about the SL2 group, well, it's similar to the Poincaré group or the group of relativistic field theory in one plus one dimensions. It's, it's really the group of relativistic field theories in curved one, one plus one dimensional space with curved, curved space time. Um, now, one question you can ask is whether we can efficiently find this state. So um, we said that this is the ground state of two coupled SYK models. So you can, uh, let's say, take two coupled SYK models. You can start them out in an unentangled state. That would be the typical state you would start them out uh, if you were doing an actual experiment. Um, and then you can uh, imagine coupling the system to a cold bath and letting it so we would have an extra interaction beyond the ones we discussed of the fermions of the SYK model with some bath. Um, and it turns out that. Um, the system will is expected to find, well, at least you can theoretically, in large n approximation, you can uh, calculate how fast it finds this ground state. And it find, finds the ground state in a time which is independent of n. So it doesn't get stuck into some other phase. I mean, in principle, uh, when you have a situation like this, it could be that, uh, OK, this state is very nice and entangled, and it's the ground state and so on, but it's very hard to find. It could be that uh, the system gets stuck into some other metastable state. But the, the claim here is that. That doesn't happen. Um, 
if you had the same process in a theory of gravity, uh, like black holes in something similar to the, well, very tiny black holes in the standard model, then uh, it looks like uh, maybe it will take longer time. So, so it's something special about the SYK model that it does it relatively fast. And um, if you manage to make the state by having uh, them coupled like this, so that you, you could imagine finding the ground state, and then at some time you can turn off the coupling, and then you would get this uh, nice, uh, well, original thermofield double state of pure, pure entanglement, no direct interactions, and you can start doing some other experiments probing this, uh, this, this other state. Um, so this is also closely related to the idea of uh, quantum teleportation through the wormhole. Um, proposed by Guy Jeffers and Wald. Uh, Jeffers is here. Um, and um, we, we could imagine starting with the thermophile double. Um, and this is a state where we have pure entanglement. So if you send a signal from one side, uh, this signal uh, will not be able to reach uh, the boundary on the other side. So you cannot send signals through these wormholes when the two systems are not coupled. But what this they, no, they notice is that we can turn on the coupling at some time. And if you turn the coupling at some initial time, then you can, in some sense, slow down the uh, acceleration or the, the, the motion of these particles. And, um, and then the signal can actually reach uh, the other side. And there is a variation of this where you do a measurement, uh, where, where you do a measurement here and send only classical information to the other side. And, uh, and you get a teleportation of a signal that, uh, from one side to the other. Of course, the fact that you can have teleportation uh, when you have entanglement is not new. It's not uh, what's interesting. What's interesting is how the message goes. So the message is going uh, through this wormhole. As it, and as it goes through the wormhole, it's exploring whatever uh, happens inside. Um, most of what I said is, very, is simplest when we take very large n. Okay? But the experiments are going to be done at finite n. And um, it's important to uh, understand the, the, the corrections that exist when you go to finite n. And in the gravity picture, those corrections involve quantum corrections, so quantum gravity corrections. Um, and for, for these very simple systems that we are discussing, the, uh, these quantum gravity corrections, the important part of these corrections, um, comes from the quantum corrections of these time superfluid modes. So there is this particular quantum mechanical mode. And uh, you can compute the quantum corrections. And the quantum corrections are, uh, have been computed. And they amount to treating this uh, boundary particle, so this, the, the position of the boundary, as a quantum mechanical degree of freedom. Um, and so it basically looks like a particle that is moving in ADS2 in, in this curved space time. So, and you can quantize it. It's a solvable problem. You can uh, find out what, uh, what the quantum corrections are, at least the uh, some of the corrections. Um, so in conclusions, um, so we can ha have certain strongly interacting quantum mechanical systems have some common features with gravity. Uh, the simplest examples involve models with almost critical behavior at low energies, and those are particularly simple to analyze, uh, theoretically. Um, and um, they have special symmetries, and they have common features with gravity, and these common features involve the particular degree of freedom, which we can call the time superfluid mode. And um, th this name, time superfluid, is supposed to be remind you of time crystals. So instead of a time crystal, we have a time superfluid. Sorry. Um, uh, and this can be analyzed in detail and quantized. Um, interesting behavior occurs when we couple two models. We have this object that, uh, in the gravity description, is a wormhole. And we'd like to analyze this particular entangled state to, to explore somehow this, this wormhole. Um, and I guess the questions we would like to understand is how uh, space time appears and how we explore these properties, how, uh, what happens when you make n smaller and, uh, and have more bigger quantum corrections. OK, thank you.